Our final story for this uh, week's episode of The Rolling Stone keeps us in Washington because we're talking about architecture. In the age of Trump, even architecture is now something that has to be politicized, not really by Trump, uh, not even really by the right, but on the left. There is a proposed executive order, okay, worming its way through the bureaucracy, which is called Making Federal Buildings Beautiful Again, which would mandate that all future, future, mind you, federal buildings across the United States be made in the classical style of architecture, okay, to make them beautiful again. Because as the order says, quote, the federal government has largely stopped building beautiful buildings that the American people want to look at or work in. And that's perfectly, perfectly true. All you have to do is, you know, look at federal buildings today. You have to re really just look at a lot of buildings today. And they are damn ugly. They are truly, truly horrendous to look at. Here are some examples. Um, actually, that uh, Christopher Bedford over at the uh, Federalist Gay, for example, the Oregon Federal Courthouse, the way it's designed, it actually created guillotine-like shadows over the benches where people were sitting outside of it. Okay? Now, I don't know if that was deliberate or not. If it was deliberate, it was clever and very sick at the same time. <laughs> Um, another example that Christopher Bedford at the Federalist gave, the Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C., um, Bedford described it as, quote, its bewildering and curvaceous walls are a demonstration of how not to use stone in construction. And it is. It's one of those weird buildings that have, that has curves where you wouldn't expect it and where there might be at the very top a line of windows. And then there's nothing except like one individual window here and one individual window there. And oh, here's another one over there. Like some weird, weird board for whack-a-mole or something. Okay, so it's true. Federal architecture is very ugly. And it's been that way really since the 60s. Because until the 60s, um, federal buildings, as much as possible, actually were built in the classical style. And then in the 60s, they decided, nah, you don't really have to do that, okay? It was supposed to be, you know, all for freedom and artistic expression and exploration and experimentation, etc., etc. And we saw how well that worked out. But apparently, this is also fascist, okay? The New York Times editorial board said that this order, quote, is advocating for an un-American approach to architecture, unquote. And it asserted that this amounts to an end of architecture because of a group of quote-unquote small-minded classicists. This is literally the end of architecture because a bunch of small-minded, fascist-leaning, classicist architects have gotten an ear to the president. And make no mistake, they honestly think that this is fascist. Michael Kimmelman, over at the New York Times, said, quote, okay, who knows what classicism ultimately means, but the draft order makes it come across as awfully prim and petty. No matter how much its supporters say that enforcement won't be dogmatic, the order provokes inevitable allusions to authoritarian regimes of the past that imposed their own architectural marching orders and dredges up images of antebellum America when classicizing federal architecture was all the rage. Associations like these might sound extreme, but then so does the order. Okay? This, I'm going to be honest here, this, this reaction, this guttural reaction against making buildings beautiful, it, it, well, it's twofold. First of all, it's an attack on our past. There is a reason why federal buildings up until the 60s were, as much as possible, built in a classical or a neoclassical style. And that's because it harkened back to our roots again. So much of American law and ideas and inspiration come from the ancient past, particularly the ancient Roman Republic. Aaron Shalev, okay, he wrote a brilliant, brilliant book about this called Rome Reborn, 
on Western shores, where he actually argues very persuasively, and I fully agree with his thesis, that the American founders believed that this new American Republic that they were creating was the rebirth of the ancient Roman Republic. The founders loved the ancient Roman Republicans. They loved them to death because they were really uh, the forebears of liberty. That's really what it was, ordered liberty, I should note. Um, that's why they love Rome. So, of course, the building style, the White House, the Supreme Court, the Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Memorial, the Jefferson Memorial, uh, Monticello, uh, Montpelier, Mount Vernon, you know, all of these either were built in a completely classical style or they used elements of classical architecture to call back to that heritage, to remember of not just where we came from, one of the roots of our country, but also to aspire, to inspire people that remember the glories of Rome, remember that. That's what we want America to be. That's what we want America to be. And uh, I mean, people today do not like that. They don't like to be reminded of the past, okay? Just take a look at the 1619 Project, which I have also made videos about here on the channel, which com which seeks to completely reframe history, okay? I don't think that it's any coincidence that the New York Times, which has, uh, you know, which is the force behind the 1619 Project, which seeks to reframe American history, is now up in arms about an executive order that says that future federal buildings must be built as closely as possible to the classical style because they don't want any reminders. People might start th saying, what's so uh, special about classical architecture? Oh, well, you know, a, you know, a, in American history, this is what happened. This is why they started doing this way back then. And this is why they did it way back then because they were calling back to the ancient Roman Republic. They don't want that. They don't want any reminders of the past. They don't want any reminders of history or any legitimate history to be done because when that happens then their narrative their ideology is assaulted and it's under attack they might keep some acolytes and some converts they might not but they don't want to take that risk that's the first thing the second thing the second reason why they are up in arms about this is because this is an attack on ugliness okay on ugliness so much of art anymore, and the late great philosopher Roger Scruton, whom I know I have been talking, mentioning so much about since he died last month, um, Requiem in Pacem, um, a great man, still has not received, I don't think, the, accol the accolades and the recognition that he should receive as one of the leading, not just conservative intellectuals, but just one of the leading intellectuals of the of, of the um, later part of the 20th century and 21st century. We, the, the world lost such a treasure when he died a few weeks ago. But anyway, the late great philosopher Roger Scruton argued um, in his documentary, Why We Need Beauty, okay, which you can find on YouTube. I'll link it down in the description box. He said that the goal of art has changed. In the past, the goal of art was always beauty, which is a transcendental uh, quality, and which is something that we need. We need beauty like we need food and like we need air. But then in the 30s, the role of the artist changed. The artist wasn't supposed to be a seeker of beauty anymore. Now he was just doing art to express what he wanted to express. He had finally kind of uh, thrown off the shackles of enslavement and now he could do whatever the heck he wanted. So now Marcel Duchamp, who was a French artist, could actually flip a urinal over, just sign his name on the bottom of it and say, this is art, in a very French sort of way. And this happened also in architecture. Because now the goal wasn't beauty, it was just artistic expression. Architects became kind of almost little despots. It's like, hey, we want to do this. We want to do this. Never mind about beauty. Never mind that this is god-awfully ugly. Never mind, you know, that people aren't going to like it. Never mind that it doesn't go in with anything, you know, around us. We want to do this just to see if we can do it and just because I want to do it, right? 
beauty, the actual goodness of beauty gave way to artistic freedom or architectural freedom. And that's something that the left too doesn't want to uh, lose. They don't want to lose that because when you start saying that beauty is an actual real thing, and it's tangible, it's metaphysical and it's transcendental, so it's not something you know, solid that you can grasp, but it is real, like the truth is real, like justice is real. Once you say that, then you start running into problems because beauty is intimately connected to goodness and goodness is intimately connected to truth. That's why you have the three transcendental, the true, the good, and the beautiful. When that happens, you automatically, if you accept that, then you automatically place parameters around your behavior, right? Because if beauty is an objective real thing, then that means goodness is an objective real thing, which means that truth is an, is an objective real thing. And if the truth is objective and real and not simply at the whims of whoever wants X to be true over here, but someone over here wants Y to be true over there, and him over there, you know, he wants N to the 10th power over there to be true, then that means that there are parameters to our actions. That means that we can't just do whatever we want to do. It means that there is actually a standard of behavior. There is a standard of living. There is actually a goal to aspire to. There is something that we can achieve, that we can attain, that we can actually, when we reach it, we will actually be better for it. They don't want to admit that because to admit that would be a surrendering of their power because their power largely stems from subjectivism by telling people that whatever they want to be true is true for them. And they get the power because then not only can they use that philosophy in their own life, but because if you tell people that basically, you know, anything you want to do, you can do, you know, it's, it's perfectly fine. You decide what's true for you. When that happens, people are much more likely to listen to you and to keep voting you into office. Surprise, surprise. Because only you being in office allows them to actually keep doing that. Because once you get objectivists into office, they're going to say, whoa, 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 slow down, guys. Just because you want something to be true doesn't make it true. So that's the reason. That's the reason. Okay? It diminishes their power both personally in their own lives so they can't decide what's real and what's not anymore but also because it loses them their acolytes the people who are invested in that lie of subjectivism which means that they are invested of in keeping the people who will allow them to keep that philosophy and to actually keep executing it out in the real world in office that's the reason why they are up in arms about this executive order, and that is why they are fighting it tooth and nail and making ridiculous uh, connections with authoritarianism and the antebellum South, like, oh boy, you know, it's connected to Nazis and it's connected to slavery. No, it's not. It's connected to things like ancient Athens, which is the, you know, the founding place of Western philosophy with Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And it's also connected to the ordered liberty and virtue of the Roman Republic. People like Cato and Cincinnatus and uh, Scipio Africanus and great men and uh, figures of Western history like that. That's the reason why this executive order is in their sights. But as usual, I have talked too much, gang, so I am shutting off the video here. Have a great weekend. See you on Tuesday. Ciao, gang. Take care.